Hey, thanks for being here. This is really great. We're going to continue in our series in Job. I just have a few reflections for you this evening. Um, I don't know that any of this will be earth shattering or groundbreaking, but I do think that a lot of what we're going to talk about this evening is important. So I hope that it's something that we're able to uh, work through together. Sorry, trying to undo what the wind did a minute ago. Um, Tonight, what I want to talk about is what we are to do with our pain and our suffering. What is it that we are supposed to do with these things? I'm a strong believer that they are, in fact, a tool and not just something that um, we have to endure throughout life. Uh, I'm not quite uh, like my wrestling coach who said that pain is weakness leaving the body and therefore it is a beneficial thing. Um, I think that pain and suffering actually can be utilized as a tool um, to help us grow, to help us mature. I think it's the sort of thing that gives us the opportunity and the ability to act. Think about when you have been in pain. Maybe you're in pain now. Maybe it's a mental pain, uh, an emotional pain, a relational pain, vocational. Maybe you've lost your job. Your job is stressful or strained. Maybe your marriage is strained or it is it is and split. Or maybe there's something else in your life that feels painful to you or has felt painful to you. Think about the distance from when that pain began and where you are now. And think about your motivation to change things based on the distance from when your pain began and where you are now. It definitely stands to be the case for me and I think for other people as well. When we feel pain, whatever kind of pain it is, and that moment when it's most acute and it's most new and it's most troubling, we are most likely then to pursue pain than in any or pursue treatment than in any other time while we're experiencing that pain. As time goes on, we get used to it. We accept it. We uh, find ourselves more and more comfortable with it, even if we are uncomfortable with it. And so we're less likely to seek treatment for that pain. Um, Somehow between my wife and I, even though we're only 35, uh, we've had six knee surgeries. So the two of us just have bad knees. I don't know if this is genetic, but Lucy's in trouble if it is. Um, We have uh, constantly, for some reason, just we just keep tearing our meniscus like that's the that's the main injury. We just keep doing that. and this, the interesting thing about a meniscus tear or even like a labrum tear in your shoulder or something similar to that is you can live with that kind of pain for a really long time. Some people live with that kind of pain for their entire life, actually. They injure themselves young. They find a way to deal with it. They do enough physical therapy to strengthen everything around it, and they just keep living with that pain. When I uh, tore my meniscus for the second time last summer, I just stopped running and started riding my bike. Like it was an easy transition. I was like, I like bikes. This is great. I just made that switch and it was no big deal at all. Now it turned out I did want to start running again. So I did eventually schedule the surgery, but when the swelling went down, when the pain kind of became more normal uh, for me or something I was used to, I was just less and less likely to make that phone call for the MRI and to call a surgeon and to schedule all of that. As we move away from the initial onset of pain, uh, particularly when it's acute, we find ourselves less and less willing oftentimes to make a change. And so I want to make a case tonight that when we experience pain, it is actually a really good time to act on that and to do something about it. But at the same time, I want to make the case before I make that case um, that sometimes what we do is we end up um, we end up treating our pain ourselves. We end up finding a way to medicate it on our own. Now, some of you may turn to like a home remedy, like you you try meditation, you try yoga, you try something like that. Um, I personally have been extremely disappointed in essential oils. I don't know about all of you, but no matter how much I run my diffuser outside, 2020 continues to be 2020. So it doesn't really seem to be working. Um, Not surprising that a pyramid scheme based on plant-based juices isn't working, but that's in retrospect, you know, in the moment, it seemed like a really good idea. We turn to these home remedies sometimes, but a lot of us turn to something that's less helpful. A lot of us turn to things that are actually uh, not only less helpful, but actually self-medicating, right? We find ourselves turning to things like chemicals. We'll turn to alcohol or pills or something to kind of like numb some of the pain, um, some of us, if we're feeling particularly like some sort of a relational pain or an emotional pain, some people turn to, uh, to pornography. Some people turn to an unhealthy relationship that you know will feel like a quick fix, um, a hit of dopamine, a, a hit of serotonin. Like you're looking for that thing that's going to make you feel better in that moment, but it's not sustainable and it's not long lasting. And I think probably all of you know what I'm talking about. Whether it's food or whether it's a chemical or whether it's a person or whether it's something on the internet, we turn to things that make us feel in that moment like we're okay. But it's not sustainable and it doesn't really last. 
And what I want to do uh, this morning or this evening, rather, is to talk a little bit about what it looks like from the book of Job to approach our pain in a strategic way, to approach our pain in a way that actually helps us manage it and actually helps us react in the moment in the right way. Again, I think when the pain is happening and it's acute, that's a really good time to act. But I think if we don't have a strategy in place, we find ourselves trying to figure it out on our own. Um, I'm going to begin in um, in verse 14 uh, from uh, chapter 19 in, in the book of Job. And you'll find that in your liturgy there. You'll find all of chapter 19. But if you want to bump to verse 14, it starts like this. My relatives have gone away. My closest friends have forgotten me. My guests and my female servants count me as a foreigner. They look at me on me as a stranger. I summon my servants, but they do not answer, though I beg them with my own mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own family. Even the little boys scorn me. When I appear, they ridicule me. All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. I am not but skin and bones. I have escaped only by the skin of my teeth. Have pity on me, my friends. Have pity, for the hand of God has struck me. Now, this particular text is in response to Job's friend Bildad, who has uh, really laid on that same narrative that um, the other friends have laid on. And Bildad has already kind of started down this road of like, Job, you have clearly done something wrong. God is punishing you. And this is God's version of justice. You're being punished for it. Um, And Job continues to maintain his innocence, regardless of the fact that his friends continue to berate him and believe that he has done something wrong. But look at the way that he goes about this particular version of complaining. He's talking about how his friends, who he's talking to, by the way, don't really want to be his friends anymore. He's talking about how he summons his servants, but they don't answer. His servants are dead. That might be a good reminder at this stage in the story. That's why they're not answering him. Um, His breath is offensive to his wife. Uh, They don't want to be around him because he smells bad. The boys in the neighborhood, the kids, I guess, are making fun of him. They're making fun of him. His friends don't want to be around him. These are actually superficial complaints. They're superficial complaints, but they're really honest, and they're actually important in the moment. You see, Job hasn't started yet. He does this at other parts, but at this particular part, he's not going through what are the, what's really at the root of what I'm feeling. What he's doing is saying, these are the things that are bothering me. These are the things that prove to me that the world is not as it should be. And this is what we call around here a lament. A lament doesn't have everything all figured out. An honest lament doesn't have everything sorted out. You're not figuring out all the root causes of the lament itself. A lament is simply saying the world is not as it should be. And oftentimes a lament is very superficial and that is okay. That's actually a good thing. And I think that it's honest and it's raw. And I would strongly encourage that that be the place that you start. That'd be the first step when you're considering what it looks like to respond to and to understand your pain. The second section that I want to focus on actually comes earlier in that because this being poetry, um, Job isn't exactly going in some sort of like chronological or even logical order. Um, This is rather some blocks of thoughts that he has. I'm going to start in verse 7 in this particular case. So if you want to bump to that in your liturgy, it says, Though I cry violence, I get no response. Though I call for help, there is no justice. He has blocked my way so I cannot pass. He has shrouded my path in darkness. He has stripped me from my honor and removed the crown from my head. He tears me down on every side till I am gone. He uproots my hope like a tree. His anger burns against me. He counts me among his enemies. This second stage or the second version of Job's complaint is deeper, isn't it? He uses words like honor and justice and anger and enemy. He uses words that go a lot deeper than, oh, my wife doesn't really want to be around me because I annoy her with my bad breath. He's talking about deeper concepts. And this second stage of dealing with or managing pain is digging deeper to figure out where the roots lie. It's okay to honestly talk about the superficial pain that you're experiencing and the discomfort. But at some point, you have to start asking yourself, what's really at the root of this? What's the thing that's caused this to fall apart in my life? What's the thing that really started to unravel in my mind or in my heart or in my relationships or in my job? What is this really about? This is where we see Job begin to dig a little bit deeper and ask the question, what's really going on here? 
This is oftentimes also when we, as we're going through this process, invite somebody else into the conversation. Because if you're anything like me, you are not super good at knowing exactly what the roots of your issues are. This is usually when we invite a therapist into the conversation or we invite a clo- close trusted friend or we invite maybe maybe someone from church who knows us well, who can see this from a spiritual perspective. Maybe, maybe somebody from our family who knows us who can really dig a little bit deeper with us. This is a great time to invite another person in. The initial lament can be just your observations. These are the things that are bothering me or I'm in pain as a result of. And then the second stage when we go, what's really at the root of this? And then I'm going to go to verse 25 for this third section. Job says this, and if you've been reading along in Job or even just listening along as we've gone through the series, this is going to blow your mind. He says, I know that my redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on earth. And after my skin has been destroyed yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another how my heart yearns within me. This is incredible, an incredible declaration that Job makes. It's amazing to me that he has the wherewithal to say something like this, considering the amount of suffering that he's experiencing and the depth at which he has been able to evaluate that suffering. I mean, he's at that point in the story where he's digging pretty deep and he's starting to figure out just how far some of the suffering goes and how bad it actually is. And yet he's able to declare that his redeemer lives and he will one day face and see God in a redemptive way. Now, he is obviously not feeling close to God in this moment. I think it's fair to say. I think if you've experienced any sort of pain or suffering, especially if it's been ongoing, you don't feel close to God. But our faith is not predicated on a feeling. In fact, if it was, we would all be atheists. Because frankly, to feel God's closeness or feel a relationship with God is something that comes and goes for each of us. And it's very circumstantial. It very much has to do with the surrounding experiences that we're having and the lifestyle that we're leading. And so I, I think that Job has chosen to believe something about God, that he's redeeming that he's present, that he hasn't left him, that he's going to be there in the end, that he's going to restore and that he's going to renew and that he's going to make things right. That third thing, that third step in this process is simply making the choice to believe something about who God is, regardless of how you feel about it. And that's not easy to do. And it's even harder to do when you're actually in pain or suffering, which is why the choice has to be made now prior to that so that you can do that when you're in the actual pain itself. But I think one of the questions I've been asking, maybe you're asking this this evening as well, is what about suffering that is beyond us? What what about when we learn about suffering somewhere else? Maybe it's in another country, maybe it's in our city, maybe it's a particular group of people or a particular person who isn't us, but we feel their pain vicariously because we know what's happening to them. We know what's become of them based on their experiences or how they've been treated or maybe how they've gone through a natural disaster or they've gone through some sort of an attack or something like that. It's a good question to ask. How do we handle pain when we feel it vicariously through someone else? That's the, exactly the question that many of you have been asking over the past several months since George Floyd, George Floyd was killed, or maybe it went back earlier when Philando Castile or Mike Brown or somebody else was killed. Maybe it's been really recent for you when Jacob Blake was shot. Maybe at some point in time, you thought to yourself, there's a person or a group of people um, somewhere that I know about, and I feel their pain vicariously. What do I do then? And for most of us, the immediate reaction when we feel somebody else's pain is how can I rush to fix that? What can I do to sort that out for them, right? But unfortunately, this puts the cart before the horse. I would actually recommend the exact same sort of three-step, three-chunk process when we're feeling somebody else's pain vicariously. Begin with lament. It's why we give you the opportunity to do that a couple of times on Sunday. Just, Just pause and say the world is not as it should be, even if it's a superficial lament. Take some time to dig deeper then after that and figure out a little bit about what's at the root of that person's pain. And then lastly, choose to believe that God is in the business of restoring people to something better, renewing their life, and then join God in that work and helping to renew that person's life or bring restoration there. It's the same process, whether it's your pain or somebody else's pain. 
This is the process we see Job loop through over and over and over again throughout the book. He begins with a superficial lament. He digs deeper to find some of the roots of where that lament comes from. And then he chooses to believe that God is in the business of restoring and redeeming, regardless of how he feels about God in that moment. And that's essentially what we are called to as well. Now, some of you, and myself, is inc- I'm, I'm also included in this, some of you have been told that simply when you're in pain or experiencing suffering or discontent, that you simply have to just put your faith in Jesus and let Jesus sort it out. And I'm okay with that if we've done some of the other work leading up to that. I think in, at best, that's actually the, the third step in this process, where we choose to believe that Jesus is capable of restoring and renewing something in us. But oftentimes we put the cart before the horse and we jump straight to that as Christians and we forget that there has to be an honest assessment, an inventory, a lament, and a digging, of, a digging deeper to understand where that lament comes from. We miss that so often. So I believe strongly that we do turn to Jesus in those moments, especially if that's the thing that we choose to have locked and loaded, that belief that we choose to have. But it has to be preceded by an honest assessment and inventory of the pain that we've experienced. You're, there's nothing wrong with you for feeling pain. And there's nothing wrong with identifying that pain and understanding it better and digging deeper into it. So skipping that and jumping straight to the belief part oftentimes leaves us empty. And the reason why is because we're not honest about how big the pain is and therefore we don't develop a faith that's big enough to encompass that pain or to restore that pain or to heal that pain. The size of your faith is oftentimes relative to the size of the pain that you've identified in your life. Your faith gets bigger as you're willing to identify the size of the pain that you've experienced or the pain of those around you. So it's my hope for you. I think after we've gone through about half, we're about halfway through the book of Job. My hope for you is that you're developing not only a process for how you would go about experiencing pain, but you're developing a theology around suffering so that you know what to do when you experience it, how to respond to it in a healthy way. That's my hope. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for an opportunity to take a look um, in the, um, the book of Job and, and just understand a little bit better like what you have for us in the midst of our pain. If it is true that pain is just part of being human, that it is something that we're going, to all, we're going to all experience. And yet it's so easy to assume that for some reason we shouldn't have to or we're entitled to some sort of comfort. And I don't understand why we have to experience some of the pain that we do, but I do know that this is the thing that you have given us to sort out, the thing that you've given us to manage. So I pray that we would learn to do it healthily. I pray that you would teach us to do that. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.